الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على سيد المرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه وبارك وسلم تسليما كثيرا إلى يوم الدين أما بعد إن شاء الله we'll have to keep it a bit shorter today because there's a bit of trouble getting back home yesterday uh, in time for Maghrib so uh, today we want to discuss another important topic uh, it's in Arabic it's called hirs and that means in English it means avid greed extreme greed and when we're speaking about greed we're speaking about greed for the world and having no contentment no satisfaction just keep wanting to have more and more and more so avid greed avid greed and hirs is a blameworthy desire what it does is that it actually leads a person to exertion and dedication of all of one's time towards one's trade and profession or means of earning or just greed for what others possess just constantly looking okay he's got this she's got this they have this I can also have it there's no satisfaction whatsoever there's no sugar ever it's always like I need to get more I need to get more this is a very bad state of the heart this is not necessarily a physical sin in terms of zina or stealing but this is a state of the heart It's a state of mind it's a state of being and it's all pervasive you'll be sitting down at home and you'll be thinking about something and you'll want it and it's just the constant desire 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 whether that be the next phone or a new house or a new car or whatever it never ends the opposite of it because generally with things when you understand their opposites you can it makes more sense so the opposite of this is contentment in Arabic it's called qana'at contentment which is to to feel sufficed with even a bit of material possessions without having to seek more you're satisfied with what you have it was recently some of you may have seen this clip from this rickshaw driver in upstate Gujarat this guy he's got his clothing is is you can see he's got patches on his clothing he found a number of uh, gold um, uh, jewelry and I think it was 70,000 rupees which is a good amount of money that is it's about 600 pounds I mean in India that's not I mean here 600 pound okay you know it's still a lot of money but in India, that's a lot of money. You know, that's a good amount of money. So what he did was uh, somebody left their purse inside the car, took off, he went home. And uh, his wife is saying, go and give it back. Go and find out whose it is right now. The, the, this woman who left here, her husband's going to be very angry with her. Can you imagine the kind of thought process that's going through their mind? He says, well, at night time, there's no, no way we can track anybody down. So the next morning he went there and where he had made a number of his people, the central location, he gave everybody his number that if anybody comes looking for a purse, then let them call me. So eventually he got a call or whatever the case is and he went and they identified what was in there. And then they said from here, take what he, he took him to his house to pick the purse up and they saw the house and you know, just basic. He said, take whatever you want from here. He said, no, I don't want anything. I've already got enough. I've already got enough. So they then tried to give some money to one of his kids or something and he was very angry about that he says we have enough why do we need this like it was just so genuine it wasn't he wasn't even playing a role you just look at his facial expression so then this woman is asking him uh, later another reporter of something that uh, how much do you make he says i make this much it's a small amount but he says the reason why it's sufficient is because from my village i have a bit of land and the grain and etc i bring that over and it's enough for us we eat the basic food and it's enough for us i thought wow what qana'at he didn't take even a thousand rupees just refused and yet if you look at his clothes he's just and he's constantly saying you know uh, this is in our sh this is in our because the person he was interacting with was a hindu they say, no, this is uh, for the sake of the hereafter. This is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, we have to be trustworthy and this, that and the other. And his wife is so interesting. She didn't say keep it. So they're both on the same page. She is saying to him, go because the woman who lost her purse, her husband's going to get angry on her. She's feeding for the woman. That's what you, talk, that's what you call insaniyah. But with everything that we have to... 
uh, our disposal and availability, Amazon and so on and so forth, so easy to get things these days. We just become that much more greedy and we're never satisfied. And then we wonder. So the opposite is called qana'ah. This cannot exist without certain things. For a person to be satisfied, a person has to have a balanced livelihood and be moderate of spending. The Prophet ﷺ said something that is just so wise. And I've mentioned this in a number of interfaith programs. The Prophet ﷺ said, Al-Iqtisad fi nafaqati nisful ma'isha. Moderation in spending is half of livelihood. Moderation in spending is half of your livelihood. Livelihood means the income you have. Moderation in spending is half of your livelihood. The explanation of that is very simple. You don't have much control. We don't have much control of what we get. Because we don't know what we're going to get tomorrow. May have a wonderful job tomorrow, may lose it tomorrow. Anything can go, anything can happen. But what we do have, if we're moderate in the way we spend that, then we are very going to be, we're going to be very balanced. And that is going to be half of our livelihood because we've got control over what we spend, but we don't necessarily have control over what we earn. But once you have it, then you control it. A balanced livelihood and moderate spending, which is the basis of contentment. Since one who earns a lot and spends a lot cannot ever be content. The Prophet ﷺ said, one who is balanced in livelihood does not depend on others. You have no dependency. You are satisfied for your own sake. That's why Ibn Ata'illah, he says, you are free and independent of what you covet not. Meaning, you are not free and independent of what you covet. Covet means what you are greedy for. You're never going to be independent because you are slave to that thing. When you're greedy for something, it's overcome you. You need it. You're a young guy. You're just about making a bit of money, but you have to pay your school fees and so on and so forth. But you must have the latest phone that costs 600 pounds. For a little gadget in the pocket. It gives you bragging rights, yes. You could get one half the price. But no, this one is for bragging rights. I don't have money, but this is, I need it. I'm a slave to it. I mean, in society, you don't call that slavery. But it is a form of slavery from a psychological perspective. That's what it, what it is. You must do what it says. The slave is fully dedicated to his master. A any slave of any master has to be fully dedicated. And the similar thing is with the greedy one towards the object of his greed. Yet the person who does not covet the glitter of this world has true freedom. He doesn't care what happens. He's got freedom. He runs his own life. Nobody tells him what to buy, what to do, where to live. He runs his own life. Uh, Wahab ibn Munabbih, rahimahullah, he said that once dignity and freedom, dignity and freedom, one day set out for a walk to search for a third companion. Who can be the companion for dignity and freedom? They met contentment on the way and they became permanently settled with it. So you want dignity and freedom, you must have contentment. And believe me, it's so it is so liberating when that happens. You don't have to worry about what everybody else is having. It doesn't matter what everybody else is buying or doing. You run your own life. If you think something is good and it's useful for you, you will get it. Not because everybody else says so. Not because everybody else does that same type of wedding. Or not because everybody spends that same kind of money. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states, that whoever acts righteously, whether male or female, while being grounded in faith, then we shall certainly revive him with the pure and goodly life. The real goodly life, when you feel satisfied, is when you do things for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then he gives you that satisfaction. Even though at the face of it, you don't have what everybody else does, but you are satisfied. It is so difficult to explain this idea to people. Because a person doesn't have much, but he's satisfied. How do you explain that? How do you sell that package to somebody? 
You can sell objects, you can sell possessions, but how do you sell an idea like that? It has to be experienced. So the first thing to gain qana'ah by is a balanced livelihood, moderate spending. That is going to be the basis of contentment. Number two is to become realized in the belief that sustenance decreed to a person must necessarily reach him, even if he has no greed for it. This doesn't mean you sit back and do nothing. You have to try. Whatever is written for us is also written according to how much we're going to try. So that should get rid of this idea that if everything is written, then why bother doing anything? Because what's written is based on what you will do or what you will not do. Because we don't know what's written. We have to do what we can do based on our Sharia guidelines and according to the rules of contentment and satisfaction. And we leave the rest to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The benefit of this is that if we don't get something that we've, been, we've set out to get, despite our hard efforts, then we know that that's not written for us. So you don't feel... You don't feel grieved about it number three another way to gain this is to realize the honor of self-sufficiency that you get in contentment and the humiliation and flattery that is sometime you have to do to get something you have to flatter somebody sometimes you have to do things to uh, use contacts you have to praise you have to do this you have to do that sometimes get a position or whatever the case is Number four, to reflect upon the states of the prophets and listen attentively to their sayings whereby patience and contentment with little sustenance becomes easy because that is how the life of the prophets used to be. The Prophet ﷺ, despite having literally millions go through his hands as in the form of collection and sadaqah, he remained a voluntary poor person so that even the lowest person in Medina Munawwara could relate to him. Even the lowest and most weakest and poorest person in Medina Munawwara can say the Prophet also only has just dates and water on normal days sometimes. And the fire doesn't, is not kindled in his home for a long time. That's the Prophet ﷺ. It's a voluntary poverty. We're not saying we need to do that. It's very difficult. But at least be content with a little. Dhunnoon al-Misri rahmatullahi alayhi said, He who is content will find repose from the people of his time. He will be, he won't have any trouble from the people of his time. And he will surpass all of his peers. That is, in dignity, chivalry, self-sufficiency self -sufficiency, and greater spiritual rank. All by Allah's grace. Except that you will have some relatives who will say, what's your problem? Everybody else is getting, why don't you do it? Right? You, have, you have some people who don't like it when other people don't do what everybody else does. So they condemn people. And that's wrong as well. Uh, whoever, the opposite condition of this is whoever's two eyes chase after the possession of others. You see what other people have, they've got the latest phone, they've got the latest car, whatever. So you're chasing after the possession, the eyes are constantly looking at the possession of others. They will constantly have, they will have chronic stress and depression. It's quite clear, isn't it? Because you'll be depressed, I don't have it. And until you don't get it, you'll feel unsatisfied. Which echoes the divine admonition as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran. وَلَا تَمُدَّنَّ عَيْنَيْكَ إِلَى مَا مَتَّعْنَا بِهِ أَزْوَاجًا مِّنْهُمْ زَهْرَةَ الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا لِنَفْتِنَهُمْ فِيهِ وَرِزْقُ رَبِّكَ خَيْرٌ وَأَبْقَى Which means, do not extend your two eyes gazing with longing and marvel to what we have given to groups of people for their pleasure. It is mere shallow adornment of this lowly abode. They can take all of these holidays, they can go gambling, they can go here, they can go there, they can go enjoying clubbing, whatever the case is. I have to come to the mosque. Don't let your eyes go in that direction because we've only given it to them as mere shallow adorn adornment of this lowly abode so as to test them therewith. The provision of your Lord is far, su far superior and shall last much longer. 
but it takes belief to believe that. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, in general, this is a hadith of Bukhari and Muslim, look at those below you in material blessings. Always stay with and look at people who have less than you, compared to those who have more than you. For that is more conducive to your not belittling the blessings of Allah upon you. If you look at what people have been given more than you, then you will always think that Allah hasn't given me anything. And if you look at people who have less than you, then you will realize, man, I've got so much. And you know, we hardly look at people, it's not, we, we normally are admiring of people who are more than us. But try it. If you have the opportunity sometimes to go to a poor person's house, or just, and just see what they did, and you think, subhanAllah, I have so much more. And then you will thank Allah. Otherwise, if you're constantly looking at what others have, saying, oh, I don't have that, I don't have that, I can do that in my house as well. I can get that in my house as well. Scholars comment on this hadith. This hadith, they say that it is the basis of numerous virtues because it encourages one to reflect upon the less fortunate in worldly blessings because that will inspire gratitude and contentment. But with respect to religious practice, it implies that one should look at one's superiors. When it comes to religious practice and piety, then look at people above you. That will then give us the in encouragement to do more for our deen. When it comes to the dunya, look at people below you, so it will give you satisfaction. If we can fine tune this, you will be much more satisfied with your life. You will then be able to walk through malls, through duty frees, through whatever it may be, among a range of cars in West End or whatever it may be, and you will not have a problem whatsoever. See, when I came back to the UK, in America I had a, like a nearly, nearly a brand new car. But there you had parking space, you had everything. Came to London and I thought, there is no way that there is worth having a new car in London. You are crazy if you have a new car in London. Unless you've got lots of money just to, to throw away. Go and check any car on the streets here and you will see that every single car needy will have a scratch or dent, just our parking problems, all the rest of it. Who are you going to chase? A friend of mine that I know very closely, he's just bought a Land Rover, a special long, long one with, uh, it's only got two seats at the back, right? And somebody came and scratched it. He's got a tracker on, on it and everything, but somebody came and scratched it. And now, Bichara, he's put He's had to put, he's got two tracking systems on there, but now he's had to put cameras outside his house, outside his flat, so that at least he can try to figure out who it is. I said, what is the point? Another friend of mine had a brand new car on lease for three, three years, a BMW. His wife insisted on buying it, getting it for him, so she, he got it. He's going to give it back the next day, three years are up. He's going back to give it back the next day. He's cleaned up all the dents and that because they charge you huge amounts of money for these little things. So he's cleaned it all up. He goes and parks it at his sister's place. Next day he's going to give it back. He goes, somebody's taken two keys right from the front to the back and given two scratches all the way on every single panel. That sets him back a thousand pounds for free, for nothing. That's grievance. What's the grief for? What's the grief for? The more you have, the more grief it provides. You have a car that has a few bangs and ding, dings and dents. Big deal. Right? I've made a conscious that I go past good cars, no problem. If I'm going to get another car, it's going to be because it's got some driving pleasure. Right? Not because of the way it looks. Who cares about that? Yes, if you get something that drives well and it takes you comfortably somewhere, that's understandable. But if you're getting it just to show others, then the, all the aggravation that comes with it, what's the point? You have to look after these things. They, they sell you these wonders and they look so well, but then you have to put a cover on it and it covers everything up. I always wondered about that. The way they promote the phone has all of these sleek designs and it's very thin and everything. And as soon as you buy it, you have to buy a cover. You have to then put a glass... A, a screensaver, uh, sorry, what do you call that? A protector. 
and then you have to get these big ones so that even when it falls it doesn't break and I was like okay what's the point marketing yes it does look good your eyes it dazzles the eyes a lot of psychology goes behind here but at the end of the day get something that works for you not just a status symbol just get something that works for you that's the main thing and yes if it is the top phone that works for you because you need that for whatever reason then get that but don't get it because it's a status symbol or because you must have the latest thing there's a reason it's a reason the same person will have two different people will have the same phone but one is going to be miserable and the other one is going to be happy it depends on what your mind is always ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for satisfaction and start thanking Allah with what he gives you and start being real about what is really good for you and what is bad for you and don't follow what others are doing just do what you think is beneficial for you in a genuine way ask others if you have to think about it but the main thing is read the stories of the righteous the pious the sahaba the prophets and you will see how they kept their life Though we can never get to that level, but at least it will inspire us, inshaAllah, to get better than we are. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us a tawfiq wa akhir da'wana and alhamdulillah rabbil alam. Allahumma anta salam minka salam tawarki ala al-jilali wal ikram. Allahumma ya hayyu ya qayyum bi rahmatika nastaghif. Allahumma ya hannan ya manna la ilaha illa anta subhanaka inna kunna min al-zalimin. O oh Allah, we ask you for your mercy. We ask you for your blessing. O oh Allah, we ask for contentment. O oh Allah, we ask you for your satisfaction. O oh Allah, we ask that you give us the ability to do all of those things which satisfy you. O oh Allah, we ask you that do not make us slaves of, of others. O oh Allah, we want to be slaves of only you. O oh Allah, all of these things, O oh Allah, grant us barakah in whatever you have given us. And O oh Allah, make us content with what you have given us. And O oh Allah, make us satisfied with what you have given us. O oh Allah, this is a month of Ramadan, your blessings are great. O oh Allah, do not deprive us of the blessings of this month. And allow this month to be the best of the Ramadan months that we've ever so far spent. And O oh Allah, give us many more better Ramadan months. And O oh Allah, we ask that you send your abundant blessings on our Messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Subhana rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifun wa salamun ala al-mursaleen wa alhamdulillah. Jazakallah khair for listening. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, bless you. And if you're finding this useful, you know, um, uh, as they say, do that like button and subscribe button and forward it on to others. Jazakallah khair and assalamu alaikum. ورحمة الله وبركاته